started, and I think probably just about everybody here is a long-term attender of our Talk at 12 series, but just in case, I'd like to share that this is an ongoing series that's sponsored by the Brown Printer um, Center for Translational Research. Um, um, and Dennis Whitlock has a major hand in organizing it, assisted by Ken Thayer here in the center. Uh, and uh, um, but the idea is to have these kinds of regular talks that involve doing research in real world settings or connecting research to a uh, connecting science and service in some way or policy. So you can take a flyer on the way out if you are used to coming here. And uh, we also have another series on how to conduct uh, translational research. If, and we have a website that if you type in Brown Trend Center, Center, you'll find out more about all of these things. Um, and, and it's a true pleasure to introduce Peter Lloyd Sherlock, who I met when uh, um, at a conference at the World Health Organization when we were both giggling at something silly that uh, happened, I think, and we started to discuss uh, his interests. And although a number of other projects in the Bronson Brenner Center have a lot of international connections, our aging program has been more USA based and then it's been sort of looking at things internationally. So I was trying to reach out in that way, and Peter's work is heavily international and has many contacts all over the world and with places like the UN and WHO. And his work, um, he is a professor of social policy and international development at the University of East Anglia in the UK and a visiting scholar here for the semester. Um, and uh, also, Fred, your spouse is here. And, Say your own name because I knew that, but I just didn't want to try and tell it. The, um, and the Peter's research looks at the health and well being of older people, and this is what interested us specifically in low and middle income countries or under resourced countries, where a lot of the problems of aging are even more acute than they are here. He's been in a number of advisory roles for a number of international agencies and introduced me to a new term. You've had a number of seconds with it. Secondment. Oh, a secondment. I didn't know what that term is. I didn't know what a secondment was. But it's a temporary transfer to another job or post. Yeah. Um, and I think if you Google his name, too, he can give you his website or you can find it. So we're going to talk about this very interesting project around long-term care and uh, that also uses very interesting methodology. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Carl, for that lovely introduction. And also, I'm, I'm just really, really grateful to the Rotten Brenner Center for hosting me uh, during my sabbatical period um, in place in my university in the UK, the University of East Anglia. Um, and I mean, just to kick things off in a slightly informal way. So um, I think sometimes I can't get this to work. I'll try this. Uh -oh. No, try pushing the down arrow on the keyboard. Uh, the power button on the keyboard. Is the nope. Down try now. Okay. Yay! Oh, yeah. mm. oh, by the way, what I forgot to do is to say, of course, every, uh, everything I'm presenting today is based on some collaborative research with a colleague of mine, Bridget Van Hale, who Carl also knows, who is also based at the University of East Anglia, and a colleague in Argentina, Nelly de Redondo. Um, so my university is based in a rather obscure city in the east of England, uh, and I guess you're used to talking about living in this rather obscure city in the east of the USA called Norwich. It doesn't have many claims to fame, but I did think I, this was worth sharing, particularly I think it's something that Carl would find quite interesting. In its tour guide, it claims to have the oldest continually functioning care home in the world, which is in the grounds of Norwich's Gothic Cathedral and was set up in 1249 for elderly Catholic priests who at least in theory, let's not asked too many questions, didn't have children of their own, and therefore didn't have any family members who, in, in theory, would be looking after them when they reached old age. And apparently, you know, you know, relative to the standards of the time, they were very well looked after, and they're still very well looked after today. Uh, they're now Anglican priests, of course, not Catholic, Catholic priests. Of course, this 
kind of residential long-term care wasn't available for the great majority of older people in Norwich or in Britain who needed it. Um, sadly, for uh, most older people, if they weren't being looked after by their families, this was the more likely option being put into um, the workhouse where conditions were typically, of course, very brutal and life expectancy was pretty short. Um, this doesn't have a lot to do with my talk, but I know Cole's very interested in the UK and British history, so I thought we'd indulge him. I guess it does make one point, which is clearly um, the challenge of providing social care for older people does go back centuries, um, and even into contexts where population aging was not very advanced. Um, and clearly the challenge of abuse of older people in residential care settings um, isn't just something that we have to focus on um, in poorer parts of the world. And we know that clearly in the USA and the UK, there are still many challenges in terms of dealing with um, regulation of residential care providers and widespread abuse of older people. And as somebody who works in development, I'm always very conscious of the fact that when I go and work in other countries, it is quite important to make clear that I'm not implying that what goes on in those settings is deeply problematic and what we do in the UK or in the USA is, is wonderful and is a model of, um, of, of perfection. So in the literature um, on social care and long-term care and more broadly in gerontology, there's very little focus on developing countries, what we usually refer to as low and middle income countries. And you know, my starting point for people who, who don't have that focus is, well, look how many old people are out there. So here we've just got some demographics. You can see that in 1990, there were about 54 million people aged over 75 in the less developed parts of the world. By 2040, it will be nearly 400 million people, old, old people in these settings. Um, and of course, what you also find is, um, as, a, as a broad generalization, um, age-specific function will be worse. So people aged 75 are more likely to have disabilities and impairments in poorer countries for fairly obvious reasons as a generalization than would be the case in high-income countries. Uh, another thing I always try and do as somebody who works in international development, I've noticed gerontologists often not often, but sometimes slip into this tendency to have a very sort of polarized comparison between the developed world on one hand and the developing world on the other hand, as if Burkina Faso and Brazil, you know, are almost identical, which of course, you know, there's, there's greater diversity within these sorts of countries than there is within what we might call the high income world. So I, I try to avoid generalization as far as possible, or at least I say that before I start to make some generalizations, which is what I'm going to do now. So I'm going to make some generalizations about long-term care in low and middle income countries. The one big exception to what I'm talking about, and I'm happy to talk about it a bit later, is China, where I think some rather different things are going on. And of course, China's a pretty important exception. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, you see very little public awareness, societal debate, um, or, or, or concern from policymakers about the fact that there are increasing numbers of care dependent and frail older people in low and middle income countries. And the standard count is that, well, we have lovely families who look after older people and we don't want to do all the terrible things you did to institutionalize older people in the USA or the UK. Um, you know, the usual kinds of very um, you know, generalized stereotypical arguments. Most governments do provide some services, often on a very limited tokenistic basis, primarily residential care services, for a few thousand older people, often specifically excluding people with complex, with complex care needs because they're actually quite difficult to look after. But they can at least say when they go to international conferences that they have a social care program of one kind or another. But the main forms of long-term care, which are rapidly emerging in these countries, given the fact that there are a lot of older people's care needs, I think fall into these three broad categories. Well, there are actually four. Um, the default provision is often people staying in hospital longer than they need to be or being admitted into hospital for longer than they need to be, which of course is very expensive and, and doesn't do anybody any favours. Increasingly, for those families who can afford it, you're seeing um, people paying somebody to provide care at home. Sometimes that will simply be an extension of a home helper, a domestic servant who used to do the cooking and look after the kids, who's taking on new responsibilities. At another level, it can be people who actually hire 
nurses, or at least people who claim to be nurses through very expensive private agencies, which are almost completely unregulated. The third area, there's also unpaid family care, of course, almost entirely provided by women, but the third area of formal provision, and that's the one that I'm going to focus on today, is private care homes. Now, I wouldn't specify whether they are um, nursing homes or less medicalized um, kinds of institution. I think it's very difficult to make that distinction. But there's been a very, very rapid increase in the numbers of these sorts of establishments uh, particularly in middle-income countries, but also in low-income countries, and they are almost entirely unregulated. And that's going to be the focus of, of what I'm talking about today. And um, there's very little data about long-term care and care homes in low- and middle-income countries. There's been very little research uh, about this new phenomenon. Um, Argentina probably has rather more information uh, than most of the countries, certainly in Latin America, about this phenomenon. And it was estimated in 2010 by the National Institute of Geriatric Care Homes that there were at least 6,000 care homes operating in Argentina, which given that its population over 75 was less than 2 million, um, you know, clearly is you know, very substantial. Um, and it's very hard to get more precise data because a lot of these care homes are not only entirely unregulated but they don't um, exist in any official capacity they're not even um, registered uh, with local government departments uh, they're effectively clandestine underground organizations and occasionally you get media exposés about this issue as I say very little academic research and a recent report suggested there were at least 600 in the city of Buenos Aires alone completely unregistered care homes and again, you get across um, low and middle income countries, and you, Argentina is no exception to this, you get anecdotal media reports every now and again about some of the very bad things that go on inside those care homes and the appalling conditions uh, that, that seem to be perhaps more the rule than the exception in many of these care homes. Um, you know, so this is a fairly typical report that I, I just picked off Google and translated about uh, a city called Rosario in Argentina. Um, just talking about you know, the appalling conditions. And you can see in, in, in these photographs, and I haven't been able to take photographs in my own research that I'm gonna talk about in a minute, that it's pretty usual for there to be at least four or five people sharing very cramped living conditions in these care homes. So I think we can you know, start to draw some sense of what is perhaps the lower end of the residential care sector in Argentina merely from these photographs. I first started getting interested in this about 10 or 15 years ago because I spent a lot of time doing research in Argentina. I did my PhD there many years ago. And I would go back and I would see these care homes springing up all over the place. And I'd see in the yellow pages lots of care homes advertising. But they weren't registered sort of in any public documents. There was no research, there was no data about them. Um, I had an opportunity through the Pan American Healthcare Organization to uh, become involved in a small survey of care homes, which so I was, I was very happy to have that opportunity. And we worked with about 100 care homes. These were not the clandestine care homes, these are ones which were officially certified. Um, and it consisted of pre arranged interviews with the people living there and the people running these care homes. And there was a very high refusal rate, over 50% refusal rate in the study. So I think one can immediately see that this was a very imperfect study in lots of different ways. It clearly wasn't at all representative um, of the sector. And there were lots of reasons why you would imagine that there was an extremely positive response bias in terms of, of, of the quality of the care and the experiences of people living in these homes. Notwithstanding that, and this isn't the focus of my talk today, so just whizzing through it, we found overall um, very uneven levels of care. There were some care homes which were actually very good, but the vast majority had very poor standards of care, very regimented. The sorts of models of care homes which perhaps are more typical in the USA and the UK 30 or 40 years ago, so they're very regimented, very little autonomy for residents, heavy use of um, restraints and of sedation, uh, much higher rates than you would typically see in care homes um, in, in high income countries. And also, and this is something which links into my main talk today, a lot of residents complained that they had actually been um, admitted into care homes uh, against their wishes. And a lot of these residents weren't people who were significantly impaired. 
um, and certainly weren't cognitively impaired, and therefore they, they should have been entitled to, to a say in this decision. And that got us thinking. Um, while we were conducting the research that I'm going to talk about, um, unbeknownst to us, uh, the Argentine government conducted a large survey of um, 1,800 um, certified, not illegal, care homes in the country, um, which it claimed to be nationally representative, or I'm not sure if it was even of the certified care homes. Again, participation in this study was voluntary, and you know this was prearranged interviews with managers plus a little bit of observation uh, when the interviews were taking place, certainly no discussions with residents or families of residents. So again, a very imperfect study in a number of different ways, but actually compared to other countries in Latin America and other middle income countries, this is you know, amazing, um, this kind of study. I've not seen anything to compare to this. Um, here are some findings, again, bearing in mind that you are likely to have a very positive bias Clearly, some of these findings reflected the observations of the interviewer, the fact that um, you know, a lot of the bedrooms didn't even have windows, problematic levels of noise. Some of these findings were based on what they were told by the care home managers. So strikingly, nearly half of care homes said that residents weren't allowed to personalize their rooms, which I assume means they weren't necessarily even allowed to put up photographs of their family in their rooms. Well, you saw those pictures before, it's hardly surprising. These are DOS houses, these aren't bedrooms. Um, and again, just a statistic there, it's hard to break it down in the same way, but um, there were more care, ho care homes, um, there were more rooms, sorry, in these care homes for three or more people than for single rooms. So this was more the norm, having at least three people in a room. And it certainly begs the question why an older person would choose to leave their own home unless they were very care dependent to go and live in those sorts of conditions. 20% of the care homes openly admitted, despite the positive bias, they don't admit people who are care dependent, which kind of blew me away. Yeah. And only 17% said they required informed consent. That's what they said. I'm not talking about what they actually did. And there was a huge lack of awareness that this might be an issue, or even what informed consent was. In fact, some of them said, yes, we have informed consent. Um, it's provided by the care home manager who fills in a form, saying they consent to the older person being admitted into the care home. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's, so this, you know, for me was very interesting. Uh, and, and as I said, this report was published towards the end of our own field work. So this is, you know, for me, there, there are some big problems in terms of looking what I think is a very important, rapidly emerging um, phenomenon in Argentina and other low middle income countries. We've got a problem trying to get a real sense of what's going on inside these black boxes, including unregistered care homes and trying to avoid response bias. And I spent a lot of time talking to Nelida, my colleague in Argentina, and trying to come up with some kind of research design that might allow us to do something which wouldn't be perfect, but would be perhaps a little better. And so we came up with this design. We decided not to focus on Argentina as a whole because there's tremendous diversity. A lot of governance of long-term care is decentralized. Um, we decided to focus on a single city, which is of La Plata, which is about 30 miles south of Buenos Aires, partly opportunistically because we have very good networks there. And to do the kind of research I'm going to describe, you do need to have very good gatekeepers and very good networks. Um, what did we do? Well, we did a document review of all the grey literature and other literature that we could find. We interviewed 10 local key informants, health professionals, social workers, people who were involved in the industry. We conducted two focus group discussions with older people living in different neighbourhoods of La Plata. We intentionally chose one which was a um, relatively affluent middle class neighbourhood and one which wasn't a flum, it wasn't a shanty town, but it was a relatively impoverished neighborhood. And we talked to older people there about their own experiences and perceptions and knowledge of, of what was being provided in the city. And, and I guess this is the, the, the more interesting part of the study, we include a clandestine secret shopper element using a network of older women who lived in the city to <coughs> carry out undercover research of care homes. Um, and there is that this isn't a widely used methodology in social science, but there are examples, a growing number of examples of where people have used what they call clandestine audit 
because basically it's the only way you can find out about important stuff. And I've just popped up some examples here, some of which relate to the health sector, some of which relate to racial discrimination in mortgage lending. Uh, and I put that one in red because I think it's a particularly topical issue, um, inappropriate sales of <laughs> firearms to individuals. And you can imagine for yourselves why having an element of clandestine research can be extremely revealing in terms of these important issues. Of course, it's an ethical minefield in lots of different ways, and certainly getting through our ethical board was, was quite good fun. Uh, and also, we are now, we've now got a paper under review with the gerontologist that Carl knows about, and we've had a bit of to and fro about the ethics of our research uh, with them. Um, reading the literature about the ethics of clandestine research, um, I think there are uh, four criteria which, we think, uh, which emerge as very important, and I think we do tick all of these boxes. Firstly, of course, we don't want to expose the research subjects to harm um, or the researchers to harm. And I'm going to talk in more detail about how we did these things a bit further down the line. Secondly, it's needed. You can't get this kind of data any other way. Clearly, it has to be a last resort. Thirdly, that this is data that we need, that it has a, a significant societal value. Wow. And finally, um, participants um, and research subjects are given access to this information and of course their own identity is protected as far as possible. So, so these are things that we tried to ensure that we did. Um, this is the group we worked with, the, the La Red Mayor, so the aging network, a pre-existing group. This is one of the reasons why we chose La Plata of older women who had already done research, activist research for the World Health Organization and the Inter-American Development Bank. They were middle class women, quite well educated women, uh, and they, we provided them with a lot of support. They knew what they were getting into. We provided three very intensive afternoon training sessions with local social workers, local gerontologists. Um, we worked together to create our research tools, which included a standard vignette. So what would happen would be that um, these women would phone up care homes, which we, we had purposefully selected in the city, and they would use this standard vignette about a relative. They would then, um, and it was an inquiry about whether they could then have a visit to the care home, they would then make a follow-up visit and there was a structured guide for the sorts of questions that they would ask. They were very closely supervised throughout this process, we did a lot of debriefing, etc. and I, I don't want to go into tremendous detail about this, uh, but believe me, the ethical process was extremely um, you know, complete to make sure that we satisfied the, um, these four criteria. So broadly speaking, this is a sort, of, sort of the scope of what we did. Um, so we started our research um, in 2016, doing our document review, talking to key informants, kind of mapping what was going on. We then ran our focus group discussions to try and get more detail uh, um, about perceptions and experiences of service use. We then went on to do our clandestine audit, which in some ways was informed by the previous um, waves of, um, of the study. And then um, we see this as an integral part of our field work and our research design. Uh, we ran some follow-up meetings with the secret shoppers. We had follow-up meetings with key informants to discuss our findings. We had a large public meeting in La Plata Town Hall and several hundred people attended that, including people who were running care homes. Um, we included a lot of media engagement, sharing our results, and we also ran a Delphi survey, an expert survey of um, people working in similar topics, academics in Argentina and other parts of Latin America, where we circulated a short Spanish version of our report, and we said, in a slightly more structured way, um, how does this compare to the cities and the countries that you are familiar with? Because we wanted to be able to see whether La Plata was a unique a badly unique example, or was broadly representative, which we suspected it would be. And now, and I guess this is the translational research part of it, we're very much involved in developing a local intervention and uh, trying to influence policy in a number of different ways. So I see this as a, you know, an ongoing process, and, and in a way the data collection and the field work, I don't see as a very sort of separate part of this process. Um, interpretation, um, groundish theory, um, 
we started off really wanting to look in very broad terms at the quality of long-term care services in the city of La Plata, not just residential care, but other providers. I had a hunch that admissions might be interesting given the work that I've been involved with in the city of Buenos Aires a few years previously. We hadn't seen the national report at that stage, but what emerged very powerfully from our different sources of data were a number of issues, and admissions and human rights abuse and informed consent came out as a very strong issue. Um, we have very diverse kinds of data, um, or, um, and so basically what we're looking to do is triangulate and see if we have consistent, um, uh, consistent findings across our different kinds of data, and trying as far as we can to seek out some exceptions to the claims that we're making, although actually I have to say there are very, very few exceptions to the claims that I'm going to make. I'm not quite sure I understand what that is, human rights and admissions. You're going to see. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but but if it's not clear, yeah, I, I, yeah, I should probably sequence that a bit better, sorry. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk you through um, some of the different kinds of findings, partly as we try and triangulate in the room the different kinds of data that I get. And this is just a typical um, bit of testimony from one of the two focus groups that we did um, with older people about their own experiences. This was in the more affluent focus group. Uh, and you know, just this one testimony, I think, captures an awful lot of some of the themes that come out of our focus group. So towards the end, we couldn't care for my mother. So we put her in a care home. You put somebody in a care home. We couldn't manage because we were both working. And she had a very strong character. Yeah, okay, she was an ornery old so-and-so. She was a very active person, but she couldn't get out to run errands. So she had some limitations to her mobility. She could still walk about the house, but she needed someone with her all the time. She was lonely. She adapted to the care home because it's a good one. In all of these testimonies, people would talk about how shamefully bad all the care homes in La Plata were, apart from the one they put their own mum in, of course. She was only there a short time before she died. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that tell you? So, you know, just, you know, th these are very rich testimonies, and I'm sure you can draw your own reading between the lines sorts of conclusions from these sorts of narratives. And so that's one of the sorts of data that we're working through. I mean, does anybody have any particular observations or comments about that? There are more women than men placed in homes, and we certainly have testimonies which relate to men rather than women. Fewer. Men tend to um, not outlive their spouses and tend to, you know, so I think that's a critical reason why. Um, so they, you know, women, when they're widowed, and we're going to come to that in a minute actually, are more likely to be coercively admitted into care homes. But yeah, it's a good question. Um, right, well, let's just see, talk a little bit about a clandestine audit. We, we, our rough estimate was that there were about 60 care homes in the city of La Plata. We couldn't say for sure. Uh, only about 20 of them were registered with any of the different go local government agencies. And we managed to cover 30. And they rang up these care homes, each were allocated a number of care homes, not in their own local neighborhoods, with this story. I'm looking for somewhere to look after my sister. She has some problems with her behavior. We kept this very ambivalent, very vague. Yeah? So just to get a sense of the care home that describing, what's the average size? They are quite varied, but the majority are small. There are two or three public care homes which are, are much larger. The majority of care homes are run on a, a pretty informal basis, almost as if people, you know, just you know, bring in five or six older people into their own home and run it as a kind of informal kindergarten for older people. There are some more high-end care homes which. Um, certainly uh, often run by doctors, um, although they're owned by doctors, the doctors don't seem to have much to do with them apart from talking to family members who are interested in admitting older people. They have lovely websites, they have a lovely reception area, but they, beyond the more cosmetic sides of the industry, one of the things we did, and I, I, I don't go into that in detail here, was we selected within those 30 care homes a real range in terms of price. That was quite important to us. Yeah. But, uh, is, this, is any of this publicly funded or does everybody pay for themselves? Oh gosh, that's another paper actually. It's, it's 
primarily you pay yourselves, but it's very complicated. You can get some support from uh, the government. Some people have social insurance, which can pay some of this as well. But there is an acute shortage of homes which are um, subsidized by the government or public insurance. So there's usually a very long waiting list for those homes. And typically people will die before they get to the end of the waiting list. It's a mess. It's a real mess. So anyway, intentionally vague vignette. Some problems with her behavior. We don't know what her cognitive status is. She can't manage things for herself at home. Again, very vague, intentionally vague. Um, we, 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 this clandestine audit was looking at many aspects of these care homes. Just in terms of admissions, which is what I'm looking at today, the majority said that they would not accept anybody with a high level of dependency. Um, in every single case, no reference was made to informed consent. In every single case, they just said, we want to see the medical history of that individual, and we just need a family member, and they didn't specify which one, to sign off on them being admitted. 30 out of 30. 29 out of 30 said they didn't even want to meet the older person until their admission to the care home. The one care home that said that it would meet the older person before admission said that was to make sure that that individual wouldn't be a troublemaker. So, for what it's worth, yeah, I'm going to have to move forward quite quickly. This, this is across our 10 key informants, so triangulating across different kinds of data. We had eight different cases that they gave us as examples, and they said they knew many more, which were very like this. We had a, a case, this was a, a social worker who is diabetic and obese and was living in her own house with a carer quite happily until her grandson got married. The girlfriend got pregnant. Um, what did the family decide to do? Go and live at grandma's house, shove her into a care home and not even visit her at weekends. She died a few days ago because she'd gone into such a grim place, locked up. I can't imagine what conditions they kept her in. Very similarly, we've got many examples of this. Last week, I had to get involved in the case where the daughter had changed the locks. We sent a report to the family court so that they could intervene. Once we did that, it's out of our hands. The lady concerned was placed in a care home since she had previously been in a hospital bed, but was completely healthy. She just didn't have anywhere to go back to, and her daughter kept the house. So we, we're starting to see across these narratives really quite a worrying um, um, pattern in terms of um, the admission of older people into care homes in La Plata. And I'm trying to keep very focused because I know time is short. There are clear limitations of what we've been doing. We did not have an opportunity to talk to residents of care homes about their experiences or directly of family members. We did have focus groups with people in the community, but not of family members of, and linking them to residents in the care home. Even in this clandestine study, I'm pretty sure there was positive bias. So for example, in our debriefing of our secret shoppers, one of them commented, I have a sense that they, the care home managers, are used to this sort of visit, but they are forewarned and cover up a lot of things. Well, of course, they were talking to a, pers a prospective customer. You know, they're not going to show warts and all. And of course, this is a very small data set. Um, this was a self-funded study. Uh, this wasn't a study funded with a large grant. So, you know, we have to be very careful about what we take from this. Although I think the fact that our Delphi survey has found a lot of corroboration across the region is, is quite interesting. Standing back from the results, I think there are a number of things that perhaps explain what was going on in La Plata and, and more broadly. Um, I talk about an abusogenic setting. One of them was that um, long-term care services um, beyond private residential care were very lacking in La Plata. So if you were a family care of an older person, there was no support that you could draw upon. There were no, you know, uh, whatever it might be, to support carers or to help out older people have more independence. So, you know, if that older person had complex care needs, you had a choice of either bearing the full burden of care yourself or it was an all or nothing choice. Relation of care homes was almost non-existent. Even of the regulated certified care homes, there was almost no rate. For example, the province of Buenos Aires Ministry of Health had some responsibility, but they were not allowed to leave their offices because they weren't trusted as public sector workers to actually be clocking on 
unless they were in their offices. So they would ring up care homes and ask them if everything was okay. So that's the regulatory framework we're talking about here. And this is fairly typical. So that was one set of contributory factors. Another one was that, and this is a slightly more technical one, but it's important. In Latin America and other parts of the world, you have a Napoleonic inheritance law. That means that when you have an elderly couple and one of them dies, more likely to be the older man than the older woman, the children immediately get half of your property. They get half of your house. Now, that puts them in quite a strong position to take over the property. They can move in if they want to do. And if that older person is then shown not to be sound of mind, they can take over the entire property. So that puts particularly older widows in a very vulnerable position, okay? Um, so there are some concerns which we're trying to address about that inheritance law. And intergenerational dynamics in Argentina, the generation of current older people in their 70s had lived in a relatively prosperous country during their working years. They were able to accumulate wealth. There were public housing programs. Younger people in Argentina today live in a country which is much less economically stable. There are not public housing programs. Therefore, access to housing is very different between these cohorts. So you can see how, you know, all of these things are contributing to what I describe as an abusogenic setting. And thirdly, there's this complete conspiracy of silence. Nobody wants to talk about this issue. And, and even more than that, it's sometimes seen as normal. This was a, um, not part of our main study. This was a key informant we shared the findings with in, 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 in Buenos Aires, a senior policymaker, and I think it's just very telling. These days, people don't even view this practice as abusive. The problem is that it's completely legal. That's what she says, anyway. The older person doesn't see it as an infringement of their rights. They just did it as a natural part of being old. The situation has come to be seen as normal. You get old, the children need a place of their own, so you sell your house and go into a care home, or you get pushed into a care home. Yeah? So how long, uh, what's the history of care homes? How long have they been, how recent have care homes been the practice? Wow. Um, there were always a few care homes for the sort of indigent, abandoned older people that were run mainly by religious organizations, and one or two little state care homes which were kind of always there on the fringes of social policy, but the sector really started to grow and become significant just in the last 15 years. Yeah. And now we've got thousands and thousands. It is moving very quickly. And I think policymakers and academics to some extent are behind the wave yeah. of what's going on. So what are we doing? Well, we're trying to strengthen legislation. I don't have a great belief in legislation actually having an effect on the ground, but it's a starting point. There is a declaration of rights of older people in care homes, but it says nothing about the process of them being admitted into the care home, <laughs> only what happens when they're in there. So we're trying to change the law at the moment, and the Argentine Congress is debating that as we speak, more or less. So we're hoping to change the law. We're trying to raise awareness. Um, and the main way that we've been playing that in Argentina is by focusing very much on human rights. Human rights discourse is extremely important in Latin America. You know, it, you know there are lots of civil society organizations. There's a lot of public sensitivity. You have to be careful. If you play the human rights card too strongly, particularly as a non-Argentine, uh, it, it, it backfires. People get quite irritated by it. Um, so one of the things we've used in some settings, but we probably wouldn't use uh, more generally because it could put people's backs up. This is a reference to the Gulag Archipelago, which a lot of Argentines are very familiar with. And there are some parallels between the way the Gulag is this hidden archipelago that everybody knows is there, nobody wants to talk about, and uses language such as our sewage disposal system, very powerful language, can be harnessed. Um, so we're engaging with the media, number of different things around that. Um, we are also um, running a local pilot intervention now um, in the city of La Plata, which emerged organically out of this process from the public meeting, where a group of older people and the local human rights organization um, are about to go live with a website which shares information about local care providers. Local care providers um, are allowed to be on this network if they sign up to various um, standards of care and of human rights. Those are policed, and if they don't live up to those standards, they will be taken off the site. So that's something we're working on at the moment. And I'm hoping, because the capacity of the state to regulate this sector in these countries is extremely limited, we're hoping that this more grassrootsy approach may, may have some promise. So that's kind of where we're going with it. Um, a question I have is whether we could apply this research design elsewhere. 
various things I would consider. Firstly, you need to have very good local networks because this is complex research and it can go badly wrong. In many other settings, you have a much less anarchic system of state management than in Argentina. We talked about doing the research in Thailand, but the government would be all over what you're doing, which would give you much less independence as a researcher. In some settings, it would be actually quite dangerous for researchers to do this. In our Delphi survey of experts, uh, somebody from Colombia said, yeah, this is great, but you'd get killed if you did this in Bogota you know, or in Mexico City. I had a chat with Human Rights Watch in New York last week, and they're quite interested in taking this research and doing it in Brazil. And when we talked about these issues, they said, oh, well, that's all right, because when we go off and do stuff as Human Rights Watch, we don't have to go to ethical review boards. Would you like to work with us? And I was like, hmm, I think that creates an ethical dilemma for me as an academic, <laughs> you know. So, uh, yeah. So, that's it, I think. That's all I've got to say. Yeah, and those are my sources cited. So, I hope this gives you some... Um, sense of what is a slightly uh, chaotic but hopefully um, useful way of trying to deal with a very important rapidly developing phenomenon in low and middle income countries and it's clearly far from perfect uh, but hopefully at least there's some lessons we can take from this experience. Thank you. Um, <laughs> When the people went in under cover, mm. was then the, uh, the primary or only goal to look at this issue of of whether the old person would be, of whether the potential resident would be consulted, or did they look at other, uh, um, were they supposed to do other things when they were in? It seems like a major and very important finding is that they didn't really care whether the person's relative wanted to. Um, it or not, but did they also gather other kinds of useful information while they were there? Or? They did. Um, the study originally um, was framed as uh, a, a trying to be a comprehensive audit of the quality of long-term care, both residential and non-residential, and we also look at paid home carers and uh, elder care centers, of which there aren't many, um, in, in the single city. Um, and the clandestine aspect of that included a lot of things. Uh, um, some of those findings are less robust. Um, so, for example, you have their observations when they're in the care home, and some of those are extremely revealing. So you have people saying that, that they always did it at lunchtime. And almost unanimously, they would say that, you know, as the older people were having their lunch together, the room would be almost entirely silent which I think is, is quite telling. They talked about, you know, one or two of these more high-end care homes claim to have rehabilitation rooms, and the rehabilitation room would be locked, or would be completely unheated, and the layers of dust, you know. So you get very telling and quite revealing observational data, which we're actually, when we got all of the findings, um, I thought, my gosh, how am I gonna write this up? And I decided that the, that the focus on ambitions would be a good focus for our first paper, uh, which is why I'm presenting on it today. And as you can see, there are so many other things you can talk about. So the issue of admissions, it was something, probably about a third of the questions they asked were related to admissions. We asked them about their use of ties, you know, that, you know, what they were concerned. They said, you know, my, my sister sometimes can be a little unstable on her legs. How would you deal with that? And I think 15 or more of the care homes said that they would, would restrain them uh, and that would be their default way of dealing with it. Two care homes actually said they would rip up bed sheets to tie them down. Um, you know, um, so we get, we've got loads of other stuff out of there. Some of it comes across as somewhat anecdotal. Um, whereas I think the fact that we can say out of 30 care homes that we surveyed out of what we think are 60 in the city, um, you know, regardless of the price they were charging, say the following, I think, you know, that's, that's something we can present more easily. And, and, and just one quick follow-up, and mm. I'm, I am embarrassed that I don't know this in the U.S., but do you know what, what the standard is, say, in the U.K., for an older person to have to give consent to enter a care home? It's a little difficult mm. here because for our nursing homes, mm. most people, um, many people are so impaired when they enter Mm. that they don't even really have the cognitive capacity to consent, mm. or they're uh, moved on an, on an emergency basis from a hospital. And for assisted living, 
you know, I, they're all, I think a number of the people feel like their families have put them there. Mm. But I don't know what safeguards they actually use here. There's very little literature on it. When I was writing this paper on my commissions, yeah, one of the first things I thought I would do is review the literature on this issue in high income countries. And I was expecting to find a lot, and I found very little. And it was talking to colleagues like Bridget, who's also got a lot of practitioner experience, I was able to find some great literature about this. So it's normally framed as um, deprivation of liberty legislation. So if somebody says, I do not want to go in the care home, you know, but you feel it's in their best interests, you, you would use that. That kind of legislation is quite strong, and it would normally have to go through some kind of judicial process, and it would be reviewed on a regular basis. And there are quite clear grounds, obviously, about the capacity of that individual to act in their own best interests. My sense is that that is used very, very rarely, and there is a sense in the UK, as in the USA, that you know, the vast majority of older people go into care homes because they're highly care dependent, and in many cases they wouldn't be in a position to provide informed consent because of their cognitive status. Well, actually, I think a lot of older people are in geriatric wards and there's nowhere for them to go home because there's nobody to look after them, and that's a very common pathway. So I actually think this is a very, um, it, it's a bit of a stone that if you lift it up, I think you'll find all kinds of worrying things underneath in the States and in the UK as well. Really about the, sorry, no, sorry. Really learn about um, staff, the characteristics of the staff, staff training, people who are on the front lines working with the prisons. Um, what did you do? I know you wouldn't yeah. catch it for the clandestine. Well, we did. admission, but maybe there's other. The key informants certainly had some interesting things to tell us about that. And actually, interestingly, some of the focus groups did as well. I, I found that in these two focus groups, in the poorer neighborhood, people had a lot more realism and awareness of the problems of long-term care than in the wealthier group. And the reason was that a lot of them, a lot of the women, had worked in care homes or had worked as private carers in people's families. They knew about the dirty stuff that was going on inside. <laughs> and so they told me some quite eye-watering stories uh, about what really happened. Um, and, and certainly, you know, what you found in, the high-end care homes, they were presented as being owned and managed by a doctor who would have friends in the Ministry of Health, which was responsible for regulating it. Um, and they would talk about the fact that they would have a team, a multidisciplinary team of, you know, nurses, nutritionists, and we have physiotherapy, you know, whatever. They get all of that and it looks great. But the reality often would be that those individuals would engage on an extremely limited basis with the care home and it would be very unqualified, uh, you know, low paid individuals who would be providing the care. Uh, and, and often the ratio of older people to caregivers was, was very problematic, especially at night. Um, in my own work where I'm looking at aging attitudes uh, across the world, I found mm. a phenomenon that um, the, the more rapidly uh, the, the higher population of older adults you have and the more rapidly the population of Asia, the more negative attitudes you get. And uh, some, some German researchers have actually come to that it is shows that regional rate of aging is You mentioned the mm. The general human rights angle, but I'm wondering whether this would also for us for prevention and maybe address aging and Because you say that the, the older adults to some extent are almost consistent. They're like, yeah, this is how it goes, right? And so yeah. you could change attitudes. of liberty. This is like imprisoning somebody against their will in very squalid conditions and sometimes equivalent to torture if you're restraining somebody and doping them inappropriately. That really resonates. If you say, and I'm totally sympathetic to that, you say, you know, we have to, you know, be more positive about aging and older people. Like, yeah, yeah. You know. So, yeah, I mean, it, it has to be attempted. Though. about this idea of the sort of abusogenic context and um, how you think that this case might be situated to other kinds of abusogenic institutions. Because it strikes me as an entirely institutional 
story mm. of when these kinds of uh, places emerge and flourish, right? Um, mm. You know, I, I, I have kids, I'm thinking about these parallels to, uh, you know, some stories come out of, uh, you know, some particularly bad institutional settings for, for children. So, yeah, curious kind of where this concept came from as we're developing it, and if you have a sense of how to situate it relative to other theories about how institutions kind of turn into these sorts of came out of a, a separate meeting that I was at in New York City last year with Carl where we were talking about financial abuse of older people and I'd just seen something about obesogenic settings and so obesogenic. so that's where the, the word came from and we could see that for example in the USA you get of course a lot of financial abuse of older people um, for various reasons um, a lot of baby boomers have a lot of money, they're very vulnerable to financial abuse for various reasons. Um, but what we found was that even in countries like Argentina and South Africa, there were other ways in which older people would be financially exploited. And finan financial exploitation seemed to fit itself within the opportunities created by certain settings um, and was always happening. Um, so I guess that's where I first started and Carl and other people first started thinking about this idea. And, and for me, I guess it's, it, it is important, isn't it, to look at the context, not just to say that, you know, people who run care homes are really nasty characters and, isn't it, you know, and to reduce it to that level, you know, so for me just to be able to stand back and see. And then to say, well, where are the, where are the policy levers? Where are the, th where are the things we can change? So clearly this issue of the conspiracy of silence, the inheritance law, you know, all will then lend to that. I, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question that well, though, sorry. No, it's really fine. I, I think it's sort of really useful theoretical concept that I can see a lot of applications for in other kinds of settings that, um, you know, you have the combination of a sort of financial incentive to prey on a certain set of people mm. on two sides, mm -hmm. you know, on both sort of, you know, compliance. Yeah, it's really mm -hmm. fascinating kind of framework. The other one I'd add to that is care literacy. What you have here is low care literacy. Like we talk about health literacy, I think it's very important in a similar way to talk about care literacy. Understanding as people get frail, you know, what common conditions are associated with frailty. How can you help that older person? Where can you get services? How can you decide if they're any good or not? If they're not, what can you do about it? So all of those sorts of things. I think, and basically what I was saying is that the poorer focus group in many ways had more care literacy than the, the richer focus group who were living in this happy denial that yes, I sent my mother to the only decent care home in the city. Um. Thanks. Uh, this is fascinating. I'm picking up on something Frank said. I mean, I'm wondering whether in these, this, this kind of we see the same thing on the daycare facade, the child daycare facade. Certainly in our country, we still have regulated. Regulated daycare, you have a lot of informal daycare, you have homes, children, and you have regulated side, you have the side, you have the side, and so forth, and mm. you have regulated. Uh, so you still have some of the same challenges. I'm wondering whether in these countries where there's child care is mm. more or about the same level of attention and regulation and, and judicial and legal kind of protection that we involved in. It's always, I mean, my, I don't know very much. Um, clearly, Argentina and a lot of these countries have gone through a rapid fertility transition. So there isn't this sense of more and more people needing these services and you know having to catch up with the demand. It's going the other way. Clearly, there are some issues about children in orphanages, children with mental health problems and disabilities. The one thing I have sometimes done in terms of trying to develop an alliance around this is to work with disability rights organisations. You often find people are put into residential care into you know as disabled children, and they remain there for of course their entire lives. So there was a big expose of disabled um, residential institutions in Mexico City done by Disability Rights International. And it so happened that when I read about some of the cases they reported on, they were people in their 60s or 70s who have been there all their lives. Um, my sense is that among the very poorest in Argentina and other parts of Latin America, there may be a more general issue around daycare. I think for middle class Argentines, 
and middle class Latin Americans. My, my suspicion is it wouldn't be as problematic um, because there would be much more, you know, sort of uh, parental input over what's going on. That would be my sense. One of the things I try and very much emphasize in this research is that this is a problem that occurs in almost all care homes, whether they're expensive or they're inexpensive. And therefore, this is a common cause for middle class Argentines as well as poor Argentines. You can't kind of insulate yourself from this problem by just throwing a few more pesos at it, which again, is a, I think it, that's probably different with daycare for kids. But I might be. You know, I, I think your, your point about too this, um, to what extent are structures kind of abusogenic? I mean, and, and I think it was difficult with long term care, but I wonder if the folks who deal with the residential child care program, for example, experience the same thing. You know, you have this classic example with long term care for older people of secondary institutions taking over functions that are typically given to primary institutions, namely physical care and sort of bed and body work and that kind of thing. And that is so difficult for a lot of individuals and families that they tend to perceive things as abusive uh, that may be almost, you know, inevitable. So even in the best quality nursing homes in the U.S., you often find people giving accounts that aren't that dissimilar. I don't know why I'm here. I never asked to be here. The food is bad. I don't like these schedules. So that there are parts of just, you know, institutional care where uh, that make the definition of abuse uh, difficult. And there, there is, there's in fact this whole movement for culture change in nursing homes, and that sort of identifies the whole entity as an abusive institution. That is a human rights issue. There are groups that believe that they shouldn't exist. Um, so I think you get into like we spend a lot of time trying to define what abuse means in long-term care facilities, but it really blurs into I suppose in the way that the routine physical punishment of children blurs into child abuse. No, mm. so, I mean like you can go into a nursing home, for example, still today where where a person has a semicircular table and it's feeding four or five different dependent people at once. Mm. And they are not obviously enjoying their meal. It's just a very quick kind of um, feeding. Now that's not inspiring dignity precisely, but it doesn't fit contemporary definitions of abuse. Mm -hmm. So I think there are. I think you raise, this raises a lot of complex, you know, definitional issues too. So and this is what we kind of that, that we have these scenarios where we you know, talk about particular injuries that might emerge out of this, but I'm thinking back to Gotham's work on mortification in total institutions, right? And this strikes me as a more general concern about, uh, you know, that was taken up by the deinstitutionalization movement quite seriously. Uh, and, and yeah, there's that boundary between, you know, when is that sort of experience more abusive? Yeah, really. It's also interesting, right? One last thing, it would be interesting for international comparison because one thing we find in, in, in terms of something abusogenic, there are financial incentives in the U.S. to keep the older person at home. Mm. So that, uh, you know, because usually you have to impoverish yourself um, in order to get our government to pay for you to go into a nursing home. And things you might be getting, like something called SSI or a, a pension, may then go to pay for your care. So there's a lot of domestic elder mistreatment because people won't transfer someone over. Um, into what would be a more appropriate level of care. So, you know, one of the things that I think is evolved in place mistakenly, and the reference point is this notion of minimally restrictive care, which to operationalize that, you have to get some assessment of what level of care is appropriate given their confidence and their functional level. So like for kids and for adults, they have to do these assessments to find out so the treatment plan matches the potential for that person to have self-agency in the areas that they can come to do so. And so I think when you state our standard is going to be achieving minimally restrictive care, that reflects a certain cultural norm in the United States, let's say, or wherever else this is in place that could be, you know, solidified uh, in law and things like that. And, and then a lot
lot of things flow downstream from that that presumably have you know led to better quality care. I mean that's not the only thing, but that's the example of the kind of thing that could lead to an improvement in the system. And I'm wondering if like something like an ethical standard of minimally restrictive care is even uh, part of the kind of cultural norm in Argentina. Short answer, no. I mean, that's one of the things on our intervention that they have to sign up to. And we also have web links saying, you know, what do we mean by, you know, and, and what are the warning signs for, you know, so, so various things like that. It's been a big movement in Spain recently and a Spanish gerontologist came over to Argentina to a big conference a, a few months ago and it, it led to quite a you know a sense of amazement and skepticism among people working in the sector in Argentina. Um, but the good thing is that he's got lots of materials in Spanish so we've been able to nick it. Um, you know so yes I agree. You know it puts the onus on the institution or anybody who signs up or to, who, who takes someone into their care to have a, a methodology for assessing what someone's competence level is. And so that takes resources and, you know, because of disability rights movements and things like that, there's now an obligation of CARES to do those kinds of assessments and to meet the, the standard of care or the standard of assessment, let's say. So in a lower income environment, I can't imagine how they're going to be able to, I mean, I've done a lot of these and it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of professional development, uh, judgment to figure out, you yeah. know, if you wanted to individualize someone's care plan to maximize their ability to function, minimize the, the, the inappropriate restriction, you know, that's a pretty difficult. It involves interviews with families, psychological assessments, interviews with staff, observations, all those kinds of things to do. I mean, I, I think what we would be trying to achieve, for example, in our intervention isn't something that would be rigorously policed, where somebody would say, we've applied a certain standard and we think we're falling short of it in this instance, and therefore there's going to be some you know, penalty for you to pay. It would just be a broad signing up to the notion that actually we should be trying to do this as little as possible. Yeah. Uh, I think that's all we could hope to achieve. And certainly the care homeowners, in fact, I've got a good friend who's a care homeowner in La Plata, um, you know, so I don't see them as the, the dark side. Um, you know, their concern is about getting sued, uh, litigation from family members. And their concern, for example, and they've been a stakeholder in this intervention, that if we put too much on there, family members are going to say, hey, hey, here's an opportunity to go in there and, you know, complain about what they're doing and make, make a fast buck. Right. So thanks again, Peter. He Thank you.